on a on another winter day. I think this set the record I heard for most days below eight degrees uh, in a row up to 10, I think that so nice day, but spring will be here next week. Uh, we're gonna start out with the roll and Rich, if you could take the roll for us, please. Chairman Representative Kelly is present in person. Vice Chair Representative Hoheisel is in person. Repre or ranking Minority Member Representative Shu is present in person. Representative Anderson is present and in person. Representative Baker. Representative Bergkamp is in person present. Representative Day is present in person. Representative Donahoe. Representative Finney. Representative Finney is present and remote. Representative Kessler. Representative Kessler is present and in person. Representative Lynn is present and in person. Representative Neely is present remote. Representative Poskin is present in person. Representative Samsel. Representative Toplaker is present in person. Representative Wassinger is present in person. Representative Weigel is present in person. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rich. Well, the first thing we've got uh, this morning is uh, final action on House Bill 2237, and this was the bill that we heard uh, as our uh, uh, moving the sunset uh, on the Ross bill forward two years, uh, and uh, as, an, as a safety measure in case the new Ross bill uh, doesn't uh, uh, get out this year. I don't want the program to end and have to start all over again. So uh, this was a fairly simple bill, but uh, David, uh, could you give us uh, a refresher kind of on this bill, just the highlights of it? <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, good morning. Um, 22, House Bill 2237, as the chair indicated, this would extend the uh, ROS uh, program an additional two years uh, through uh, June 30, 2023. Currently, it's scheduled, uh, the program and the, and the, is scheduled to end June 30 of 2021, so of this year. And this would also then, of course, extend the uh, the tax credits that's available under the program through uh, tax uh, through tax year 2023 as well. Stand for any questions. Any questions for David? We will now uh, take up House Bill 2237 uh, and work that bill. There's a motion concerning 2237, Representative Ho Heisel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we pass out HB 2237 favorably. Have a motion, have a second from Representative Hsu. Any discussion or uh, amendments? If not, uh, we will, uh, not if you would uh, move your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I close on my motion. All those in favor of extending the sunset for uh, two years on House Bill 2237, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 
The motion passes and uh, 2237 is uh, passed out favorably. Thanks, committee. Mr. Chair? Yes. If I could uh, have my record or my vote recorded in the minutes, please. You may, and Representative Weigel would like to have his vote recorded too. Oh, Representative Neely would like to have his recorded. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. We will now have uh, three hearings. Uh, these, uh, these bills uh, all came uh, to us by way of uh, Representative uh, Waymaster, and uh, we will go through those. And we have, uh, I just, uh, uh, received an email from uh, Representative Waymaster that uh, delays in the Appropriation Committee are going to keep him from being here in person. He did submit testimony, but so when we get to that, uh, uh, he will have testimony on all three that uh, to read through. But uh, we'll open the hearing now on uh, House Bill 2236. And if we could start out on uh, 2236, there's a physical note in your packet on this. And uh, then Amelia is going to give us a briefing on this bill. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Kemley. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Kelly and members of the committee. Uh, I am Amelia Kovar Donahue, and I am an assistant revisor. House Bill number 2236 would authorize appraisers to exclude the sales comparison approach in mortgage financing appraisals of certain unique residential property in rural counties under certain conditions. Specifically, subsection A of this new section provides that when an appraiser is developing an appraisal of residential real property, which has been identified as unique in style or square footage or bowl that's located in a rural county and the appraisal is for the purpose of a mortgage financing transaction, then the appraiser may perform the appraisal without completing the sales comparison approach if the approach cannot be developed for a credible opinion of value or indication of value due to a lack of available comparable sales within 30 miles. In such a situation, in the appraisal report, the appraiser shall provide an explanation of the reasons for the exclusion of the sales comparison approach and document their efforts to obtain comparable sales or market data. Subsection A also provides that financial institutions shall not decline to proceed with a mortgage financing transaction due to the exclusion of a sales comparison approach in accordance with this new section. And then subsection B provides definitions for purposes of this section. There's a definition for financial institution and also rural county is defined as a county with a population of less than 10,000. And the bill would take effect from and after publication in the statute book. And I would be happy to stand for questions. Any questions for Amelia? Amelia, I have uh, one that came to mind. Is there a, a definition of unique, uh, like a standard definition of unique as is used in this bill? No, this, this particular section does not define unique. Okay, so yeah, in, in this particular bill, then unique is probably defined that you can't find comparable sales uh, in, a, in a reasonable area, I think 30 miles is what it was, but so that would make it, just wonder, it, would you assume that that makes it a unique piece of property in the instance where you could ignore the, the sales uh, comparisons? It, the, the language of the uh, new section does provide that the the uniqueness has to be in style or square footage or both. So it does it does um, discuss those concepts. Um, and then it does also um, have the 30 mile limitation for finding comparable sales. In, in the appraisal 
you know, when, when you look at appraisals, there's some, you know, the, the appraiser is going to have to make that determination of, of the uniqueness and whether something is comparable or not, and then make the appropriate adjustments. Okay. Uh, Representative Burkamp, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you know if the 30 miles is standard across the country, or I, I, I just don't know where that number came from? Or is it just whoever created the bill put that in there, the 30? I do not know if that is a standard number. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, mm. any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can you tell us how many counties would qualify as rural of our 105 counties in Kansas with 10,000 or less? I do not have that number in front of me. I'm not sure if research is there uh, participating today and they might be able to pull it up faster than I can. I do have access to the, um, the division of budgets list, but it's not broken down. It's just an alphabetical list of counties in front of me. Um, I'm not sure if research could answer that for you today. Research have a possibly have an answer for that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll have to look up that same list, but uh, we'll get that we'll get that information to the committee yet today. Thank you very much, Melissa. And Representative Poskin, did that answer what you needed? Okay. Representative Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe maybe that can't get that because if. Uh, that the statement was made that it's the county is less than 10,000 in population. Is that what I heard? Or the city? Uh, looks like it says in the bill that uh, a rural county and uh, means any county in this state with a population of less than 10,000 as certified by the Secretary of State. So. I mean, there would be a lot of counties less than 10,000, but. Uh, so uh, are we saying then that 10,000 or less population in the county, or are we considering that a rural county then? Or am well, I, well, for. Am I asking that correctly, or. Would this be uh, classified as a, as a rural county? Uh, it, it would, uh, I think. I, there are population levels, and I can't remember exactly what they, uh, what they were, but as I remember the county that I live in, which uh, I would consider uh, more rural, but uh, its population puts it at semi-urban. So, uh, and that's about 33,000 for it. So that's a semi-urban county. So. I can't remember whether it was below 25,000. I, I don't remember. Maybe research can find that out for us uh, on whether 10,000 covers all the rural counties or, or not, or whether this bill just specifically, it looks like, is defining a rural county as, uh, for its purposes, it looks like 10,000 uh, people. And uh, we'll find out numbers for you and see what, uh, see what they show. But this is as defined by the Secretary of State, um, it looks like. So the other was defined, I think, on the semi-urban that for my county was defined by uh, census numbers uh, that uh, through a U.S. classification. And that, that's what I was asking, if I could follow up on that, uh, because Kansas is broken down, at least by cities, uh, first, second, and third class. And that's primarily designated by uh, the amount of uh, population within the city limits, if I remember correctly. So I was just trying to determine, is there some kind of classification where we're talking rural or uh, semi-rural or semi-urban? Uh, because I've never heard of that before, so I'd like, I'd like to begin a clarification. Uh, we'll, we'll get some numbers uh, on what this uh, particular bill relates to and what the 
certification uh, means from the Secretary of State uh, uh, on that. And um, that would be, uh, we'll have that before we'd uh, work the bill. Then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions for Amelia or? Thank you, Amelia, very much. Any comments from research on uh, at all other than uh, the uh, getting us the population numbers on House Bill 2237? Or on House Bill 2236? No? Okay. Uh, this will official, officially open the hearing on House Bill 2236, and uh, we will start with the proponents, and uh, I, I have no one down as an oral proponent uh, for this bill. Is there anyone that would uh, wish to speak uh, as an oral proponent? Okay, we do have two written-only proponents, and one of them was uh, Representative Waymaster, who was going to try to be here, but uh, has not been able to because of his committee. So he is, his is in, in your packet. And also uh, Martha Smith, Executive Director, Kansas Manufactured Housing, has a proponent written opinion that's in uh, your packet of information. Uh, any other uh, ones that wish to be an oral uh, proponent or a written uh, proponent of this bill? Okay, we will close the um, hearing. Well, we will close uh, after we officially open the hearing. We won't close it yet, uh, but this will close the proponent uh, testimony on House Bill 2236, and we will open up uh, the um, neutral testimony on House Bill 2236. And I show no one as a neutral on House Bill 2236. Anyone wish to be a neutral on House Bill uh, 2236? Seeing none, we'll close the neutral portion of the hearing and we'll open the opponent portion of the hearing. And uh, I have no one listed as an opponent of House Bill 2236. Is there anyone uh, that wishes to be, to testify as an opponent to House Bill 2236? If not, uh, we will officially close the hearing on House Bill 2236 and uh, check with uh, our vice chair, are we still streaming on YouTube as the Senate financial uh, no, sir, we've been upgraded to the House. Okay, well, thanks very much. We didn't want to get people out in YouTube land confused uh, by uh, who we were. Mr. Chairman, this is Heather yes. O'Hara. Yes, Heather. Hi there. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we've pulled up the latest document that we could find from the Secretary of State's office regarding county populations. And according to our first count, there would be 66 counties that have a population under 10,000. Um, we're working to make sure that this is correct, but that's our initial count. Okay, well, that's, that's a sizable number that would uh, fall under this then. And uh, that, that number would be something that, uh, if, if the bill is worked, that we could always look at is 10,000 the right number to have. And so thank you very much, Heather. Appreciate it. Okay, we will move on. Uh, these are quick hearings today because there's there's not a lot of testimony in on on any of them. Uh, but we will now open the hearing. Uh, not, uh, we will we we'll, we will begin with the first uh, House Bill twenty two sixty eight and it's enacting the Kansas Rural Home Loan Guarantee Act and authorizing the state treasurer to guarantee a certain portion of rural home loans made by financial institutions. And uh, 
we will ask uh, David if he could uh, give us a uh, overview of uh, House Bill 2268. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2268 would uh, create six new sections of law to be known as the Kansas Rural Home Loan Guarantee Act. Uh, the provisions of the uh, of the act would be under the administration of the state treasurer. Uh, section one of the bill provides the name and citation of the act, Kansas Rural Home Loan Guarantee Act. Uh, section two of the bill is the definitional section of the of the act. I just pointed out one. Um, the definition of loan means a transaction with a financial institution to provide financing for the construction or renovation of a single family home in a rural county. And then rural county, as as um, we saw in the last bill, this has the same definition of a, as a county in Kansas with a population of 10,000 or less. So it'll be those 66 counties as identified by Heather. Um, section three authorizes the state treasurer to enter, in, enter into agreements with financial institutions to provide loan guarantees against default for uh, rural housing loans. Eligible financial institutions are required to apply their usual lending standards as they would as the borrow comes in to uh, determine you know, credit worthiness for particular loans. Uh, the treasurer shall administer the provisions of the act is required to adopt rules and regulations to administer the act, including development of an application process. Uh, the treasurer is given authority to enter into contracts for implementation and administration and may impose fees and charges to recover costs related to such uh, administration. Uh, section four uh, provides that each agreement entered into by the treasurer to guarantee against defaults on a home loan will be backed by the Rural Home Loan Guarantee Fund, which is created, we'll get to in a second, in section five, and shall receive, and must receive prior approval by the treasurer or a designee of the state treasurer. Eligible costs under a loan may include land and building purchases, renovation and new construction costs, equipment and installation costs, pre-development costs that may be capitalized, financing capitalized interest during construction and consultant fees. Uh, the portion of the loan that is actually guaranteed by the treasurer under the act would be the amount of the loan that exceeds 90% of the appraised value of the home except that no loan amount above 125% of the appraised value would be guaranteed. So it's kind of it, you know, it starts at 90% and then kind of the ceiling then on the guaranteed would be 125% of the appraised value of the, of the home at, at issue under the, under the financing. Uh, section five, this does establish the rural home loan guarantee fund in the state treasury. Um, all monies in the fund would be used to provide guarantees against loan risks and to pay administrative costs associated with the act. All fees and charges imposed by the treasurer and any other monies that might be received by the treasurer under the act would be deposited in the fund. Um, there is a provision that if the state treasurer certifies to the director of accounts reports that the balance of the fund is going to be insufficient to pay for a particular loan guarantee, that that would authorize the director to transfer an amount from the state general fund to the rural home loan guarantee fund to cover the in insufficiency. So there is sort of a backstop with the state general fund um, to the rural home loan guarantee fund to cover any particular guarantees. Uh, section six, this requires the treasurer to prepare and submit a report annually on activity under the uh, rural home loan guarantee act to the house committee on appropriations or the appropriate budget committee and the Senate committee on ways and means or the appropriate subcommittee thereof beginning with the 2022 regular session, and the bill is effective upon publication in statute book or July 1st, 2021. I can stand for any questions. Any questions for David? Represent Burkamp. Thanks, Mr. Chair. On the, uh, the threshold, the 90% to 125%, is that when the loan is first originated? I assume by the bank. I'm just trying to think through like the process. I wasn't aware of like when a bank would give a loan for greater than 100% of the value of um, property. Maybe this is for somebody later on, but I'm just wasn't sure on the timing of that aspect of it. Uh, yes, I, mean, I think this would be on uh, as the loan is originated. Um, I might defer to maybe some of the some of our banking folks and others that actually make the loans and how. They determine that value based on the appraisal and when that all 
how that process all works. But yeah, I mean, I think the 125% cap is just, I mean, I don't know how many times it might actually be a loan amount of that much, but this, this would just be kind of, just kind of a ceiling just in case there would be a particular loan of that, of that much that it wouldn't all be guaranteed. Thank you. Person Washinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This might also, since it's for rural areas, it could be an older home or something that has been uninhabited for a while, then the bank financial institution would, would be more likely to say, we'll give you 125% of, the, of I think the, the value will be so that they can get that work done. It's just a, it's just a guess, but that might be one of the reasons why they do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, David, uh, in section five, and you, you may have uh, answered this already, but it says subject to appropriations. So if there are no appropriations made, then no guarantees are issued. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I imagine if there wouldn't be appropriations in, in the fund or there are no other sources of revenue for the fund. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I guess I might defer to the, to the treasurer, but I, I imagine there wouldn't be a lot of guarantees approved by the treasurer since there would not be fund, funds there to, 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 to make those guarantees, but um, it wouldn't necess necessarily uh, be that if there are other sources of, of revenue perhaps. And this bill, uh, different from the one that we're going to look at next, I think the one we looked at are going to look at next had a maximum dollar amount, I think, of 250000 And there's no maximum or, uh, uh, or minimum dollar amount in this uh, residential real estate, is there? Yeah, yeah that's correct. There, are, there is no, no maximum on either the amount of the of, of the loans or an aggregate out of, out of the fund. That's correct. It's a little yeah. bit different than the next bill. Yeah. So this one could go above the $10 million that's in, in the next bill, uh, if there were that many requests and, and the money available to guarantee them. Correct. Okay. Any other questions for David? Thank you, David. Any uh, comments? Uh, on this bill from our uh, research staff? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might review a, your question that you just asked to David is contemplated in the fiscal note. And so the fiscal note does speak to the costs that would be incurred by the Office of the, Sec of the State Treasurer and the need to hire two FTE positions at a cost of $149,500 from the State General Fund in fiscal year 22. Um, but the point is made in the fiscal note that the agency would need state general fund until there is enough money in the newly created fund to finance the additional positions. So it does speak to your question regarding um, subject to appropriations and, and how that fund would secure money. So in, in, this, in this instance, if no money was appropriated, uh, then uh, no guarantees and there wouldn't be the uh, the need uh, for the staff uh, right away until there was money appropriated. Yes, that would be correct. And the Department of Revenue also opined on the fiscal note to say if there wasn't sufficient funds in the guarantee fund to pay for a loan guarantee, the bill would require a transfer from the state general fund to the fund to cover the shortfall, but they simply can't estimate what that fiscal effect would be without knowing the, the loans that might be subject to this program. Okay. Any questions for Melissa? Thank you, Melissa. Well, th this will uh, officially open the hearing on House Bill um, 2268. And uh, we have listed as proponents, uh, first one, Stephanie Mulholland, Heartland Credit Union Association.
Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, committee. Um, again, I'm Stephanie Mulholland with Heartland Credit Union Association. Um, just wanted to express support for, actually my comments would apply to both um, House Bill 2268 and to 2282 if you don't want to hear from me twice this morning. Um, we represent credit unions across the state and the 690,000 Kansans that belong to credit unions. Um, as not-for-profit financial cooperatives, um, part of our mission is to help members build that financial security and help strengthen the middle class. A few of the ways that we do that are free financial, financial counseling to help people get on a home ownership path. Also loans to Kansans who don't have a perfect credit score. So last year we lent to 117,000 Kansans who had a credit score under 640 to help them buy a home or a car. But we do recognize that there may be situations, whether that's the effects of the pandemic, um, government restrictions on financial institutions or other factors where not every borrower can qualify for the lending that they need. And so we do believe that loan guarantee programs like what's outlined in both of these bills could be one more way to help consumers bridge the gap and we'd um, stand ready to help consumers if the committee decided to move forward with this. Happy to take any questions. Any questions for Stephanie? Representative Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So j just something you said at the end there. So the, these borrowers who might be eligible for this are probably don't have access to credit now. Does that mean that essentially the state is taking on the risk of giving these loans to, to these people now? So that is, that is how a loan guarantee program works. A third party is guaranteeing that if that borrower defaults on the loan, the third party is picking up the obligation. And so in this case, that would be the state through this guarantee program. Yeah. Um, it's my understanding of Mr. Chairman, you would know as well. Well, yes, and, and uh, I seems to me I remember reading though that the bank had to go through its own approval process and its normal underwriting guidelines. So, uh, the the in a lot of these instances, I, I think it might be uh, uh, what uh, Representative Wassinger was saying is that uh, it's a house that uh, it's uh, it's a property that maybe needs more money than what uh, a, a traditional uh, underwriting standards would allow and so this this would allow a guarantee to get it up to get them some more money to uh, either to build it because uh, particularly in in rural areas uh, you can build a house and it won't appraise for what you cost what it costs you to build it or if you're trying to do the remodeling of one uh, again the the work and what you want to do on it uh, may exceed uh, the appraised value so this would give you a chance to still do it and have that kind of that guarantee uh, on that so uh, it's i think it deals with an issue that uh, and Stephanie and Alex next would know that maybe rural Kansas faces that uh, the uh, more urban areas uh, property is 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 hot and and uh, and uh, there are more builders so you you may have a better chance of getting it built within the appraisal but so uh, if I think that's that's probably the the thought behind this. The chairman said, the, I believe the bill does call for using typical underwriting requirements. So it, these would not, it would not be putting financial institutions out there to take a, a chance on unnecessary risk that would put the state at risk, if, is the concept when we go through those underwriting requirements. That give enough of an answer for you, Representative Shu. Okay. Any other questions? Representative Day, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, if, if uh, the speaker could speak like closer to the microphone <laughs> in that room, it would really help those of us who are in other rooms or online to be able to hear her better. Um, additionally, I, j I just was wondering um, if you had an idea of how many people have defaulted on loans that have been given uh, with those it, it, like in the past year, I know, I know this has been a, a difficult year to compare, but um, 
if, if it gives us an idea, maybe in 20, 2019 versus 2020 uh, going forward, what would be the anticipated number of defaults? Thank you so much. I don't have that number in front of me. In terms of defaults on loan guarantee programs, that might be a difficult number to find. There are some guarantee programs out there, um, but I can get you the number on, on defaults in general on, on home loans or other markets. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hoheisel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Stephanie, for being here today. And it's great to see you guys in the banks testifying in favor of the same bill. We, we do appreciate that. Uh, my question is on the, the second bill, which I believe you're just testifying on both of them now. Um, the loan may be guaranteed up to 80% of the value of the loan on the second one for ag loans. Um, why are we doing that 80% on that? Is that just a fluctuation on the assets or... So I, I can't answer that. We weren't involved in drafting the bill, so I'd have to defer to, to whoever had the bill drafted. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And we, we will try to get the answer for uh, you for that because there's only one person to track down uh, that uh, uh, had this bill, so we should be able to find out, Representative Pohai. So any other Questions? Yes, Representative Poskin. Thank you, Chairman Kelly. Um, in the case of borrower default, then does the state become the owner of this individual home? I'm afraid I don't have those details either. That may be something we could refer to the revisor or to Representative. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, David. Uh, in the case of default, the, the financial institution is the, is in the first position and this is in the kind of at the bottom of page of page one in uh, section 3b of the bill the financial institution would be in the first position and the state would be in the second position to recover on the loan so i think it would be the particular financial institution would have sort of the first um, recourse on, on recovering on the loan and then they would fall on the state hey, yes representative poskin Thank you, Chairman Kelly. Just to follow up on that, so then if the financial institution has the first right to recovery and say they recover 75% of the loan, then the state would be liable for the 25% remaining? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think that's when the, the, the guarantee would from the state would have to kick in on, on the remaining portion of that loan. Any other questions? Representative Finney. Representative Finney, do you have a question? Maybe uh, the question was answered. Do you see her hand still up, Representative Oisel? Representative Finney, do you have a question? Can you hear me? I have a question, but can you hear me? Representative Finney, we could barely hear you if you're unmuting and trying to talk. Okay, never mind. I'll, I'll ask it later. Okay, thank you, Representative Finney. Any other questions for Stephanie? Oh, Representative Toplicker? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this one, Stephanie. If if you can't, I'll just maybe go to the revisor. But in Section 4, uh, uh, B, line 16, it, it mentions that eligible costs may include land and building purchases. Not sure if we went over this, may I, I may have missed it, but... Um, is that like outbuildings on a piece of property? Is that what that refers to, or is that? That is a question I'd have to refer to the revisor as well. And, and, uh, and if it is, is it like someone could, could, could put, uh, could renovate a barn under this and, and uh, not do much to a house just uh, what do you what do you say to that, Mr. Revisor? 
yes, that's uh, that, that that is a good question. It does say land and building purchases. I there's no more specific uh, definition in the bill to that. I think it could relate to like Representative Tupperker said, uh, an outbuilding or something something like that. Um, the, yeah, the bill just doesn't really speak in any specific, but I think it would include potentially the other pieces, uh, other outbuildings and things on, on the property where there's a more homestead or something. That will be, as Representative Toplicker, that'll be some issues that we'll want to, uh, if we work the bill, that we'll want to work our way through uh, some of these. So all good questions that you're you're asking, and and uh, we will we will definitely want to find those out. Uh, you, uh, we have uh, Representative Finney's uh, question text in, and Representative Shu is going to ask it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Finney's question is: Are there any similar home buyer programs for people with a 640 credit score that we have outside of this proposed bill? I believe there are several home buyer programs out there. I don't have a list in front of me, but I'm happy to get that together for you. I know the USDA does some loans. Um, I believe the FDIC does. There are some other options out there. Yeah, and the uh, I th I think there would be the bill that we just uh, passed last week uh, would have an option uh, to it for uh, for the financing of uh, rural real estate. So and and that was. That was, I think, 2,500 uh, people and above. So there, there was an option there, and there, there's some other ones that could be used. Um, but uh, this, this is one that I think was uh, specific. It, it appears maybe was to uh, deal with uh, some of the situations where the uh, appraisals don't come up to the value of what's needed to do the property. So, and in this case, uh, it appears, and we'll want to look at that too, about the the liability of the state, what it could potentially be if, if this really took off. So, Representative Finney, thanks for your question. Uh, you use technology to its fullest uh, uh, to... Uh, get around the sound issue, and you were able to get Representative Shu to handle it for you. So thanks for that. Any other questions for uh, Stephanie? Okay, thank you, Stephanie. And yeah, you do, I think you did cover two for one on this one. That works for you. Thank you, yep. Mr. Chairman. And uh, our next proponent we have listed is Alex Orl, Kansas uh, Bankers Association, Senior Vice President, and welcome, Alex. And uh, you, we delayed long enough so that you'd be able to get here. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I've had some, uh, both of my sump pumps at my house went out, so great deal to deal with this morning. So appreciate your flexibility. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, appreciate the opportunity to be here today um, in support of HB 2268, and I'm gonna try and do a twofer as well. As Stephanie, we do support both bills. Um, and Stephanie did a fantastic job, and, and, and Vice Chairman Hoheisel uh, alluded to the fact that it's great to see us working together. Uh, I'd like to remind the committee that about 95% of the time we do uh, on good financial policy, we, we work together. Um, we see this as just another tool in the toolbox uh, to trying to help our, uh, our communities and the customers we serve. If there's any other opportunities to, uh, to do that uh, and help with that, we are absolutely supportive of those tools. Um, now, Stephanie took, took, took the brunt of the questions, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, I appreciate Chairman's Way, uh, Chairman Waymaster uh, introducing this bill, recognizing there is a housing problem in our state, without a doubt, not just rural, but also urban, um, that we need to figure out on how to, uh, how to, um, to, to look at that and, 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 and fix it, and, or at least trying to attract and retain folks. Uh, for those housing needs. Um, I'll tell you from the KBA's perspective, we have formed our own internal task force on housing uh, with bankers across the state, urban and rural, from uh, 
uh, many different uh, walks of life, and we are looking at this internally from our association as well. So on that fact, we appreciate the in introduction of this bill. We appreciate the need. We appreciate the, the, the premise of it, uh, and we do stand in support of it. Like I said, it's another tool in the toolbox, and you'll hear me up here multiple times on that. If there's any ways we can help our communities and customers we serve, we will absolutely be up here in support of that. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'm not going to add any more. I told my colleagues I'd be brief. I was not as brief as I told them I'd be, but I was brief. Thanks, Alex. Any questions that anyone would like to ask Alex so he doesn't feel lonely and, and ignored up here? Representative Burkamp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Alex, thanks for being here today. Um, I guess part of my thought process question is, is there a reason why maybe banks don't feel comfortable taking that risk today versus having to be guaranteed by the state if they feel it's a good loan? What, why do they need that backstop? If um, A lot of it is regulatory oversight, Representative. Um, I mean, we are not uh, uh, given the ability to loan out those type of loans to folks that we 100% finance. Them. We're, we're just not given that ability. Uh, so this is just, like I said, another tool in the toolbox to help folks that one, cannot get traditional credit, or two, do not necessarily have the best credit. But bottom line, I can speak for bankers across the state. If you are credit worthy, you have the ability to, uh, to buy a home, we will absolutely loan you out the money without a doubt. So this is just, like I said, another tool to, uh, to help our folks serve their customers. Yep, go ahead, Riverson for camp. Uh, one last quick one. So on the, um, I guess, investment property first, typical, um, if you're a primary resident of the house, you'll typically, if you do an investment property, do you see them often take loans in excess of like the appraised value or is that, like, and again, maybe you're not in the best position, but I'm just curious, like if, I, I'm just thinking through this bill and, you know, if you're going to have more people who are investors versus primary home people taking advantage of, you know, the increased loan capability, maybe what the banker's point of view would be on lending to investment people versus primary care people. Uh, once again, Representative Burkham, um, to, to answer your question specifically, I, uh, I do not have that available to you without checking with significant experts in this area. Um, but bottom line, it comes down to just how can we help them? And, 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 I mean, we do have regulatory oversight, same with the credit unions, on the ability to finance loans. I mean, it's not a, we'd love to help out anybody we possibly can, but there is a regulatory oversight. So on that, uh, it, would, it would be subject to that as well. Thank you. Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Alex, for being here. Uh, is the problem with housing, because I see this kind of across the state, both in rural and not so rural areas, uh, and I'm talking about uh, medium, uh, a starter, what we used to call a starter house for a family. They get married, they have a kid, and they want to buy their first house. Is the problem somewhere in the, like what you mentioned, regulatory? Or are there just not enough banks or, or financial institutions that are making home loans? Or is there something out there prohibiting? Because what, what I hear a lot is that there, there aren't enough homes to be purchased that, that are people are looking for. So uh, I, I kind of like to nail that down so we can fix that problem, and then we can go on and, and then we can, you know, uh, finance those people that want to buy a house. Um, uh, Representative, I appreciate that question be uh, because I think that is a way bigger discussion than just this bill. Like I mentioned, the KBA has formed our own task force to look at something uh, and, and to figure out how to uh, figure out our housing. I think it's, it's, it's multi, I think there's mul multiple problems. Uh, you know, we have the first time home buyer savings account legislation that you all passed out last week. Uh, that is going to be a tool to help retain our next generation 
of folks to buy homes, live in Kansas, and work in Kansas, and contribute back to the economy. So we need to implement tools like that to keep our folks here local, because we do have an out-migration problem. That is absolutely, it's factual. I'm not, our, our agencies report on that. So one, we don't have enough tools to help folks buy homes. Secondly, we do have a housing shortage in communities. I'm gonna use Coffeyville, Kansas. Uh, the chairman of my, uh, my, or my next chairman of my board uh, is from Coffeyville, Kansas. Um, and he mentions that everybody that works in Coffeyville lives in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. They all live in Oklahoma and they commute to Coffeyville because there is not affordable housing in Kansas or not necessarily affordable, but livable uh, houses that they want to in Kansas as well. So, Representative, this is a much bigger discussion that I believe the legislature is going to be dealing with for the next couple of years. I know the Commerce Committees are looking at this as well um, because we have to bring all minds together. This is not a partisan thing. This is not a bank credit union thing uh, whatsoever. Um, this is something we need to figure out and we need to nail down. And I, I pledge to this committee that there's anything that we can help and, and provide more technical support on, we will absolutely be here. And I, so I, I know I didn't answer your question uh, directly, Representative, but I know um, that this committee is going to deal with that and the legislature is going to deal with that. And we look forward in helping with those solutions because it is a big problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Toplicker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Alex, is there a income level schedule of any kind in this bill? I mean, I, I didn't see any, but and it looks like the state treasurer will be administering the rules and regs on this, but uh, it, any income cap at all that you that you would suggest or I'm, I'm never in favor of caps, I'll be honest with you, Representative, and neither neither would our industry. Um, uh, I'm not aware of uh, what I am aware of is the cap on the population. But in regards to income, I would have to defer to the uh, revisor or the executive of our state. And, and Mr. Chairman, just to, just to follow up on that, uh, could... Do you envision anyone that could have a couple of projects going at the same time, buy a couple houses and and maybe next to each other, anything like that? Uh, does this bill allow for that? Um, it is my uh, understanding of the legislation that it would not prohibit things like that. Once again, this is a loan guarantee. There is financial institutions across the state lend out money for multiple properties uh, if it's an investment property. Um, so this, once again, would just go back to the same standard of business that we operate on a daily basis of providing resources uh, to our, the customers, communities we serve. So I, I do not uh, believe there is any prohibition on that. Representative Hoheisel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Alex, for being here today. And again, same to you. It's great to see you guys in the credit unions back on the same team. Um, my qu I, I have two questions, if I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, the first one is the same question I had for Stephanie. On the ag part, is the 80% cap on that because of fluctuation and, and ag assets? Is that why we're capping that at 80% of the loan guarantee? I mean, um, typically, I mean, there was an amendment made to SB 15 last week or two weeks ago on the Senate committee that mirrored the farm credits regulations regarding not being able to make these tax exempt loans on loan to value of 85%, more than 85% of the value of the property. We were perfectly okay with that regulation because our regulators, once again, will not allow us to usually go past that. So I do believe this is in standard with what we are currently under with regulatory oversight. Okay, thank you for that. And my second question, do you know of any other states that have a, a loan guarantee administered through the state, um, especially targeted rural development? Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, I do not. Have okay. Okay. But I can do some research on that and get back to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Representative Donahoe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our, uh, is, uh, and I'm kind of following up on that question. Um, does Oklahoma offer anything in the way of incentive? And I would anticipate if Kansas does something that Oklahoma will react uh, and offer something. And um, obviously you have to have that in mind as you're thinking about where are we gonna end up with this thing and what are we willing to do? Uh, to answer your question regarding Oklahoma having a similar program, uh, I do not have that answer, but I will get back to you and we'll check in on that. And because, I mean, you, you're exactly right, Representative Don. If, if they have something, we need to be looking at implementing something. And if we implement something, they will probably look at implementing something similar. Well, it's kind of like the situation in Kansas and Missouri, you know, on the border, and we know what transpired there, so... We have a little history on it. Sure do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Hsu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Alex, a lot for being here. I know it's probably been a tough morning. Um, this is less a question and more just me going to talk at you about my concerns and then hope and leave my mind open to be assuaged about it. So. Um, for for me, I agree with Representative Weigel. The, the base issue is ho housing shortage, right? Um, I, in my opinion, or just in my estimation, the issue is not really access to capital. As we've talked about before, there are other loans and interest rates are low. And so essentially, in the end, the state takes on risk and has to get into kind of the loan evaluation game, which as far as I'm aware, we don't do a ton of. And so I guess I'm just leaving my mind open to be how, how th this tool becomes necessary. Sure. Uh, Representative, uh, I, I concur with your comments. I agree. Um, there, is, uh, there is concerns, of course. Um, but once again, it comes back to, are there enough tools in the toolbox to help our, oh. Alex, you might, sorry, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, Re Representative Shoup. Um, we need to figure out multiple ways to, there, there's not a silver bullet for this issue. And this is a, hopefully, I, I, I believe, a start to this conversation. Uh, and um, like I said earlier, um, as an industry, we have formed our own task force and we have met once uh, in the last month, but we are going to continually start meeting and, and, and to address this because I don't believe it's just a state issue, it's a federal issue too. Representative Burkamp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Last question, I promise, for me. Uh, do we have a rough estimate of how many loans would qualify for this today or any kind of ballpark? I'd have to defer to the reviser or the drafter of the legislation on that one, Representative, to be honest with you. I'm just curious from it, and I know we've kind of touched on it, but just before we proceed, it'd just be nice to know kind of number-wise what we're, we're looking at. So I know HB 2268 is for populations of 10,000 or less. I do understand. Other legislation, which I believe you're going to hear next, and like I said with Stephanie, we're doing a twofer here, um, but um, um, I, I do not, but, or I would have to re refer to uh, uh, David or, or uh, the Chairman Waymaster on this. Any other questions? For example, Weigel? Thank you again. Uh, just a quick, I was just thinking something. Uh, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, uh, GI loans or guaranteed loans to the federal government if they're uh, service. Do you know what the cap is on that for a, uh, uh, I, I can remember, and I'm going I'm to date myself, it's almost 50 years since I've got out. And they gave it, don't laugh, I'm still here. Uh, <laughs> in the packet they gave me when I rotated out of, of the Army, they gave me like a little green certificate, if I remember, and it had, uh, you qualify for, and back then, I think it was like $12,500 that they would like guarantee uh, towards the purchase of a house or a farm. Uh, do they, do you know if they still do that? I'm sure they do, and do you know what the, the rate is or what the... Happy on that? 
I wish, um, you know, uh, when I walk around this building, well, Representative, first and foremost, thank you for your service. I do appreciate that. Um, but I do not have the answer to that, I'll be honest. Um, and I wish I had Kelly with me, uh, our uh, other part of our GR team. She is a, uh, somebody that used the GI Bill um, for education as well. And, and I remember uh, her, her father was a, you know, a pilot with the, with the Marine Corps. Uh, so uh, she'd be actually the person that would actually know that answer. Uh, and I will check with her and get back to you absolutely on that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions? Don't see any, any hands up. So, uh, Alex, thank you very much. You, Mr. Chairman, I thought Stephanie got all the questions, but I didn't. No, it, it was <laughs> equal opportunity uh, today. I, I appreciate the committee's look on this legislation. I really do, and I look forward to working with this committee and other lawmakers on anything housing because it is a major, major issue in our state. So, thank you. Thanks, Alex. And uh, those are the only two oral proponents I have. Anyone else wish to speak as an oral proponent? If not, uh, call the committee's attention to we have two written proponents. One is Representative Troy Waymaster, uh, District 109, and the other is Mark Toom, Vice President of Governmental Affairs, Affairs Kansas Association of Realtors. And uh, so read through their um, uh, his, their written uh, proponent testimony. Yes, sir. Representative Toplicker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I did have one last question. For Alex? Uh, for you or anybody. Uh, the okay. question is uh, eligibility to receive a loan. Do you have to be a resident of Kansas? Well, on reading the bill, it talks about uh, the rural counties in this state. So uh, yeah, I don't know that we'll, David might be able to refer that to eligible applicant uh, uh, is uh, is uh, whether that uh, has a specification. David, could you answer that uh, question for us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, the bill does not uh, specifically define that what, what the borrower would be. I mean, the, the, the loan itself would need to be for the financing uh, for construction or renovation of a single family home in a rural county and in the rural counties which would be within in Kansas. Um, I suppose if the borrower was an out of state borrower that's you know, renovating a home in in Kansas, in a rural county, you not necessarily have to be a, a a resident. But yeah, the bill does not speak to uh, to that as uh, regards to borrowers being residents. Okay, so by that, uh, the property has to be here, but uh, the borrower could have lived across the state line and renovate it, and then flip it, I guess, or or whatever. So. Okay, that's that's another uh, thing to to look at too as we go. Any final question on the proponent side? If not, we'll close the proponent portion of the hearing and uh, uh, we'll open the neutral portion. And uh, I do not uh, show any neutral uh, testimony at all. Does anyone wish to testify as neutral? Seeing none, we'll close the neutral portion of our hearing. We'll open the opponent portion of our hearing. I have no one listed as an opponent, and we receive no written opponent testimony. Anyone wish to testify as an opponent uh, to uh, uh, this bill? Seeing no one, we'll the opponent portion, and we'll close the hearing on uh, uh, House Bill 2268. And... Uh, our third one that we're going to do today may be shorter because we had most of the testimony and a lot of the questions come in uh, already, but uh, this one is uh, uh, more on the ag side, and uh, uh, there is a fiscal note in your packet of information to look at, and uh, David, if you could give us a briefing on 2282. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 2282 is going to have a very similar structure to the bill we just heard. This is also then creating six new sections of law to be known as the Kansas Agricultural Loan Guarantee Program. Uh, provisions of the program would be under the administration of the state treasurer as in 2268. Um, section one provides the name and citation. Section two is a definitional section again. I just point out the uh, definition of farming within the, the program there to mean the cultivation of land for the production of agricultural crops, raising of poultry, production of eggs, production of milk, uh, production of fruit or horticultural crops, grazing or production of livestock. Uh, farming is not does not include production of timber, forest products, nursery products, for sod, and does not include a contract to provide spray, harvesting, or other farm services. This is a definition that is currently in uh, KSA 175903 in the uh, Agricultural Corporations uh, statutes. That's kind of where this definition of farming came from. Um, section three is a section that authorizes the state treasurer to receive, after receiving approval from the Agricultural Loan Guarantee Review Committee, that we'll talk about in section four, to enter into agreements with financial institutions to provide loan guarantees. Uh, against default for agricultural loans. Uh, the loans would be backed by the Agricultural Loan Guarantee Fund that is created in Section 5 of the bill. Um, the aggregate principal amount for an eligible applicant would not exceed $250,000, so that would be the cap on, on the principal amount of the loan. And the aggregate standing amount of all loan guarantees for all applicants under the program would not exceed $10 million. So there is a total cap um, on both the loan and the, uh, all, all uh, guarantees under the program, uh, unlike in the uh, previous bill. And then as been mentioned uh, previously, the loans may be guaranteed up to 80% of the value of the loan. Um, loan proceeds may be used for working capital for a proposed or current farming operation, including lease of facilities, purchase of machinery equipment, or purchase of real estate. Those are the um, eligible expenses for the loan proceeds under the program. Um, if those proceeds are not used for those purposes, the loan un guaranteed under the program could be voidable by the state treasurer uh, if, if it's those for their purposes. Um, the treasurer is again required to administer the provisions of the program and adopt those regulations, including that application process for the program, um, and again can enter into contracts and impose fees and charges uh, relating to the program. Uh, section four. This is a little bit different than in the last bill because this actually does establish an agricultural loan guarantee review committee that is located within the office of the treasurer. Uh, the committee would be five voting members appointed by the treasurer or and the state treasurer or the treasurer's designee would serve as a non-voting chairperson of the committee. Uh, the members, uh, those voting members would then annually elect the vice chair. Um, the committee has three kind of major functions. It has to review all applications for loan guarantees under the program and then would actually have approved the applications if it's deemed to represent a reasonable risk and have sufficient likelihood of repayment. And then would also provide advice to the state treasurer on matters regarding administration of the program. Uh, members of the committee, that when they attend meetings of the committee or subcommittee would be allowed uh, subsistence allowances, mileage and expenses as under current law for other, other boards and commissions. Section five, this is the establishment of the Agricultural Loan Guarantee Fund within the state treasury under the administration of the treasurer. All monies in the fund would be used to provide guarantees against loan risk and pay administrative costs related to the program. And then all, all fees, charges, or any other monies received from you know, the legislature, from appropriations or other gifts or grants or anything, well, all that related to the program would be deposited into the fund. Um, there is also still that, that kind of that backstop if there are if the treasurer certifies that there's not monies in the fund sufficient to pay for a particular guarantee, it certified the treasurer would certify that to the director of accounts reports, and then director of accounts reports would have to transfer a state general fund amount to cover the uh, insufficiency. Uh, section six, this is, again is a uh, reporting requirement for the treasurer. An annual report on shall be submitted on or before February 1st each year. Uh, to the House Committee on Appropriations or Appropriate Budget Committee and the Senate Committee on Ways and Means or the appropriate subcommittee thereof. And on this one there, this bill would become effective on publication in Kansas Register, so it could be 
if it makes it through the process, could be enacted a little bit sooner than July 1st, depending on when it gets published in, in that register. And I can stand for any questions. Questions for David. So, David, to, just to be clear, uh, just like the previous bill, the the property or the land or what's being borrowed for is in Kansas, but uh, the borrower uh, as eligible does not, by uh, the way it's written, have to be a Kansas resident, just like the previous one. Well, this one does have a definition for eligible applicants, but it just means a person applying for a loan guarantee under the program who complies with the application procedures prescribed. So as I suppose it's as the treasurer would enact that application process through rules and regs, um, there could be a potential, I guess, to limit that to uh, Kansas residents, but within, within the bill itself, there is not a, a restriction to Kansas residency. Okay. Any other, any questions for David otherwise? If not, uh, thank you, David. And uh, just uh, so I notice uh, on our stream, I see uh, that uh, State Treasurer Lynn Rogers has joined us. And so uh, would like to welcome him. And uh, maybe uh, after we get through our testimony here, if you have any comments that you would like to make on the two bills that uh, you would be involved in the guarantee portion, uh, we'd appreciate it and understand if you don't want to or, uh, or if you do, we'd, we'd appreciate that. So uh, uh, research, uh, any comments on uh, this particular bill, 2282, that you would want to pass on? Mr. Chairman, the fiscal note is similar to the prior fiscal note regarding that there is uh, the program would need to be funded by an appropriation of the legislature. And as David reviewed in section five, if the balance in that guarantee fund is insufficient to pay an amount um, for the loan guarantee, then the bill would allow for the transfer to make the from the state general fund to make it solvent. There are similar program costs that were provided by the, the office of the state treasurer. Um, to increase expenditures by $149,500 in fiscal year 22. The agency does request that, that would, uh, those funds for, would come from the state general fund. It would need at least one new FTE position and may also need to hire a credit analyst um, depending on how many applications are received. Um, the fiscal note continues to say that over time, the program is intended to become self-supporting by assessing fees, but the agency does not have an estimate when this program would become self-sustaining. Thank you. Any questions for Melissa? Thank you, Melissa. Well, this, uh, we will now open the hearing on House Bill 2282. And uh, for the proponent section, we have heard both of them. Uh, our oral proponents, Stephanie Mulholland, uh, Heartland Credit Union, and Alex Oral, uh, Kansas Bankers. Uh, any other comments that you, you feel that you've covered everything for it? Okay, so our, we did get... Uh, Two for one testimony there. Uh, that's the only uh, oral proponents that I show. Anyone wish to testify as an oral proponent for House Bill 2282? If not, I'll call your attention to written testimony uh, provided by Representative Waymaster and then John Donnelly, Kansas Farm Bureau. We have uh, a proponent testimony in your packet, so uh, please. Uh, uh, reference that. Uh, any any other proponents for the bill that wish to testify? If not, we'll close the proponent portion of our hearing. We'll open up the neutral portion. I show no oral or written neutral appoint uh, 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 witnesses. Does anyone wish to testify as neutral on House Bill 2282? If not, that will close the neutral portion. We'll open up the opponent portion, and I show no 
oral or written opponents. Anyone wish to testify as an opponent to uh, House Bill 2282? If not, uh, this might be an appropriate time to ask our state treasurer uh, if he would like to make any comments on uh, both the bills that we uh, dealt with today that involve uh, his uh, agency, uh, 2268 on the residential side and 2282 on the ag side. And if you do, uh, Secretary, uh, would appreciate your comments. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair Kelly. I was not planning to make comments, and so these are just going to be off the cuff. Uh, but uh, I do think I, I just want to make sure that I made myself available to committee members for any questions. Um, you know, both of these bills uh, transfer credit risk from a financial institution to the state of Kansas. Uh, that's the, the con. Um, the pro of that is it could be loans uh, that have great potential. Um, and the banker or the financial institution just can't make uh, their guidelines uh, make it fit. Um, credit worthiness, uh, credit an analyzation uh, is not something our office does. So that's why we suggested in our fiscal note that we would need a credit officer and one or two analysts, depending on if one or both of these uh, are approved. Um, we have looked around, uh, we did a bunch of research. Uh, there are a couple states that we are aware of. Uh, California does a small business uh, guarantee. We have not been able to obtain information on that. And we have found one other state that we think that has done some guarantees on the state treasurer's office. We're still trying to obtain that information as well. Um, one of the questions that came up, uh, you know, and I think the question that this committee has to decide is, you know, do you use, do you allow investors? Do you allow out of state people? Um, if we excluded any of those people in our rules and regs, we would have to go through the legislative rules and regs process, any exclusionary uh, work in that regard. Um, if it's just implementing the, the regs as written in the, le the statute, then we can do that in our office. So uh, introduction or the amount of time it takes to get this going could take, take some time. Um, I know one of the other concerns we've heard from financial institutions is how easy it will be to uh, get the money on the guarantee. Um, you know, and, and as been mentioned, uh, the state would take the second loss. Um, you know, the, the bank is in first position, the state is in second. And so uh, we would have to be able to have either access to the state general fund uh, where we could tap into it easily or have an allocation in our, our office to be able to use it as well. Um, you know, we're not talking, if it's a $10 million fund at 250,000, we're talking about 40 uh, people. Uh, 40 loans, if we're looking at, at uh, the real estate side, it technically, if they were million dollar homes and it was a $10 million fund, there would only be 10 of those. So there's, again, no upper limit that we have to look at. From my experience as Lieutenant Governor, when we traveled for the Office of Rural Prosperity, uh, you hit it on the head in terms of housing stock, it's not available. Uh, and in many cases, they don't have builders and developers that will build in these smaller places. And oftentimes, if you put in $200,000 into a house, um, it'll only appraise out at about, about 150,000. So I think that's one of the unique things of 2268 that um, that 90% to 125% guarantee could have some merit uh, down the road. Um, but I'm anxious to see the, the Kansas Housing uh, Resources Corporation is doing a housing study the first time in uh, about 25 years. And I know this will be a topic that they'll bring up of how do we get rural rural housing. So, um, so I think there'll be some additional work there as well. So um, those kind of conclude my comments. I'd be open to any questions that any committee person uh, has. Uh, Secretary Raja and Representative Lynn, you have a question? I do, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this might be more for the revisor. I'm just wondering if we are looking or considering any sunsets on these, given that the state would be in the position to recover on these loans. We, I, as I see the bills, there would there is no sunset. You you could add that, uh, but that would have to be something, or even a review if you wanted to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I I think we need to evaluate their effectiveness, especially if it does become. Uh, provide a cost to the state. Any other questions for the secretary? Mm -hmm. 
No, it doesn't uh, look like it right now, but uh, we appreciate you being willing to take uh, additional questions from the committee as we move forward. Uh, thank you, Chair. We'll, we'll continue to investigate what uh, other states are doing. If we obtain additional information, we'll make sure that we pass that on uh, to you and, and to the committee as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, with uh, this uh, concludes our, our testimony, and uh, this will officially close the hearing on House Bill 2282. So, committee, our, our next meeting is Monday, uh, and that will be our payday lending uh, hearing. And so uh, that should, uh, I think, probably take up uh, most of, uh, most all of the time next week. So... Uh, kind of if you've got any questions that you formulate ahead of time, please bring them. We're going to break it down into uh, into three sections, really. We'll have uh, the proponent section. We'll have uh, a, a testimony from the regulators. And then we will have uh, a, a some testimony from the payday lenders. And so we'll break it down, there will be limited number of oral proponents, so we'll have plenty of time for, for questions, and uh, uh, we'll have a number of written or proponents and opponents and neutrals, whatever, uh, that uh, we'll have available for you to look through, too. But So that will be Monday, and then after Monday, uh, we'll have one more meeting in this first part of the session, so it's going rapidly, and we'll have a few things that could come up in that last uh, that last meeting. So thanks very much for today, and we will see you uh, Monday, hopefully with 50 degrees, uh, all the snow melted off the ground, and uh, and the first flowers of spring uh, sprouting up. So after after these 10 days, we're adjourned.